The Daily Report this Friday afternoon. Pandemic-related restrictions on social gatherings and business hours will be lifted here in Korea starting next Monday, but the mask mandate will stay in place for the time being. Meanwhile, across the border in North Korea, celebrations to mark the 110th anniversary of the birth of the country's founding father today as the international community braces for possible shows of military might. Elsewhere, Russia acknowledges the sinking of its flagship in the Black Sea amid conflicting reports about the cause of the sinking as Ukraine claims credit for Kremlin's naval loss. Welcome to the Daily Report. It's Friday, April 15th here in Korea. I'm Min Sun Hee. As largely expected, authorities here have announced plans to roll back COVID-19 restrictions on large gatherings and business hours in line with efforts to embrace a new normal. But the mask mandate remains in place for now. Our Choi Min Jung has our top story. South Korea will be lifting all social distancing rules for the first time in over two years. Some measures have been in place since March 2020, but now people will be able to enjoy their lives much like they did before the pandemic. As promised several times, the government has decided to boldly lift social distancing rules, one of the most important antivirus measures, now that the virus situation and the medical system is under control. Prime Minister Kim bu announced Friday that the ban on social gatherings of more than 10 people will be lifted, and businesses will be able to open for 24 hours starting next Monday. This means people can gather with as many people as they want, without curfews. Large events, including at places of worship and rallies, can now be held without limits on capacity. And from April 25th, people will also be able to enjoy movies and concerts indoors while having something to eat. However, people will still be required to wear masks at all times. Indoor mask mandates will remain for the time being. Authorities had been considering the lifting of outdoor mask mandates, but they have decided to put that on hold for now. The mask wearing requirement for outdoors may change after the government assesses the country's virus situation over the next two weeks. The eased measures follow a declining number of infections. South Korea reported 125,846 new cases on Friday. The figure has remained in the 100,000 range for three days in a row now. We're continuing to see a downward trend as cases drop by more than 22,000 compared to a day ago and by almost 80,000 on week. The number of severely ill patients remains at just under 1,000, and there were 264 additional deaths. The Prime Minister also announced that from April 25th, COVID-19 will be downgraded in its classification of infectious diseases. Currently, it's categorized as a level 1 infectious disease, the highest on the government's four-tier scale and regarded as the most dangerous. A downgrade to level 2 would mean self-isolation will no longer be mandatory for anyone infected with COVID-19. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. And today, that is April 15th, marks the 110th anniversary of the birth of North Korea's founding father. And despite widespread concerns of forceful shows of military might to commemorate the occasion, preparations thus far on this Friday afternoon remain innocuous. Here's Kim Dami. North Korea plans to hold a large-scale performances and fireworks on Friday night to celebrate the regime's 110th birth anniversary of its late founder, Kim Il-sung. The North State Media reported Friday morning that Pyongyang is set to stage a youth ball at Kim Il-sung Square at 7 p.m., along with a musical performance in commemoration of the so-called Day of the Sun. With this year's birth anniversary seen as a significant event, leader Kim Jong-un may attend a Friday night's celebrations in a move to stress internal unity. North Korea usually considers a 5th and 10th year anniversaries as a key occasions. But contrary to expectations, there are no signs of military activity, such as a military parade. Instead, as some experts note, the North may stage a military parade around April 25th to mark the 90th anniversary of its Korean People's Army Foundation Day. Amid the speculation, South Korea's unification ministry said Friday that Seoul is keeping close tabs on the North and a possible military parade later this month. North Korea appears to be highlighting Kim Il-sung's birth anniversary with all kinds of events and celebrations during the month of April. But watchers point out that more focus has been placed on the 10th anniversary of the Kim Jong-un regime. 
The Nord's recent unveiling of its large-scale construction project also lines up with the 10th anniversary, showing North Korean people the accomplishments of the Kim Jong-un era, as well as elevating Kim to the same rank as his grandfather, the founding leader. Kim Dami, Arirang News. Song Kim, the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, will be here in South Korea next Monday for relevant talks amid widespread speculation of impending acts of provocation by Pyongyang in the near future. According to U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price, officials are closely monitoring the situation up north as the regime celebrates the birth of its founding father on this Friday. Price noted that North Korea has a history of commemorating such occasions with forceful shows of military strength. Meanwhile, Song Kim's talks with his South Korean counterpart No Gyudok here in Seoul are expected to include a coordinated response to North Korea's recent missile tests. In other news, President-elect Yoon Seok-yeol will seek to raise Korea's foreign policy to better reflect its economic and cultural status. Intentions to this end were shared during an interview with the Washington Post that was published on Thursday. Mr. Yoon claims South Korea has been a, quote, passive player in the international arena, mindful of its, quote, aggressive neighbors, including North Korea and China. He pledged to change this reality during his term in office. He also spoke of expanding South Korea's interests to matters beyond the Korean peninsula to include issues of global concern ranging from supply chains, climate change and vaccine production with its regional counterparts and those in the West. Over in the Black Sea, a Russian warship that had been leading Kremlin's naval assault against Ukraine has sunk amid conflicting reports about the cause of the sinking. Our Kim Yosan explains. Russia's defense ministry says its warship that was damaged by an explosion on Wednesday has sunk. It explained that the flagship of Russia's Black Sea fleet, the Moskva, sank in stormy seas while being towed to a nearby port. Ukraine claimed late Thursday that it had struck the Russian warship, causing it to sink and forcing its crew to abandon the ship. In the Black Sea region, the cruiser Moskva was hit by Neptune anti-ship missiles. The flagship of the Russian Black Sea fleet sustained substantial damage. A fire started. Other ships tried to provide assistance, but due to a powerful explosion caused by ammunition and stormy conditions, the ship turned over and started sinking. Moscow initially denied reports that the warship had sunk, claiming the fires had been extinguished. The apparent attack and sinking of the 510 crew vessel comes weeks after Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine and represents a symbolic blow to the Kremlin. Against its backdrop, the Pentagon explained Thursday that there was an explosion on the ship, but added it cannot say at this point if it was hit by a missile. Washington said that based on its assessment, the ship is able to make its own way and is heading east for repairs. We don't have the capacity at this point to independently verify that, but um, certainly the way that this unfolded, um, it's a big blow to Russia. They, this is their flagship, the Moscow. In related news, Ukraine's parliament has backed a resolution recognizing the actions of Russian forces in the country as, quote, genocide. The text approved by a majority of 363 lawmakers says that the actions committed by the armed forces of Russia are not just a crime of aggression, but are aimed at systematically and consistently causing the destruction of the people of Ukraine. It also called for appeals to be sent to foreign governments, parliaments and the UN to recognize Russia's war as a genocide. Kim Yosan, Arirang News. Also in related news, Japan is piling on punitive measures against Russia amid the latter's violent campaign in Ukraine. For more, I have Walter Sim live on the line. Walter, it's good to have you on. Nice to see you again, Sunny. Right now, Walter, earlier this week, Japan's cabinet agreed to freeze the assets of almost 400 Russian individuals, including uh, President Vladimir Putin's two daughters. Let's start with details about these additional sanctions. 
Yes, indeed. And these sanctions really come as, you know, Japan has been appalled by the atrocities of the war in Russia. Um, we see Prime Minister Fumio Kishida having gone as far as to explicitly describe Russian actions in Ukraine as intolerable war crimes. And so um, the decision earlier this week follows a news conference where Mr. Kishida accused Russia of indiscriminately killing civilians and attacking nuclear facilities. So, well, on, on the sanctions front, Japan has really been acting in line with other G7 countries and it hopes to use such asset freezes to increase the economic pressure on Russia such, uh, and, and such that you know Russia will feel the strain and back down on its atrocities in Ukraine. So with this latest round of uh, sanctions, the total number of individuals uh, now being sanctioned has come to nearly 500 people, and they include lawmakers, military personnel, as well as other people in uh, President Vladimir Putin's inner circle, such as you know oligarchs as well as his uh, family members as well. On top of that, another 40 banks and military-related companies are also under sanctions, whilst Japan is banning the import of things like Russian vodka as well as some wooden products and machinery. Um, it has also expelled eight Russian diplomats based here. Right. Walter, staying with sanctions, last Friday, I believe, in a rather surprising shift from an earlier cautious stance of uh, sanctions aimed at Russia's energy, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced that Japan will phase out Russian coal imports. What appears to have prompted this particular decision and what alternatives are being explored by Japan with regard to its energy needs? Right. Um, well, to, to, to be honest, I think the key trigger behind this decision was the fact that other G7 countries have also said that uh, they would phase out coal. As you pointed out, this is a huge decision. And uh, But on the other hand, you know, I, I think Japan, given how major faces in Japan. Uh, Japan would be reluctant to be seen as the sole holdout in, in terms of uh, not banning coal imports. So because of that, uh, I, I think Japan has made the announcement. But what is especially telling is that Japan has not committed to any particular timeline or deadline by which it will stop importing Russian coal. Um, when asked about this earlier this week, uh, Japanese Economy Minister Koichi Hagiuda would only say that Japan will carefully assess electricity demand as well as the influence on industries. And I, I think, you know, the announcement really is to, uh, whilst the announcement has made headlines around the world, uh, what the Economy Minister's comments really suggest is that Japan is trying to buy time as it figures out how to, you know, manage the the manage the the shortage of coal uh, as it tries to, you know, diversify its sources of coal as well as other energy sources before the stoppage actually takes uh, effect. It's also quite telling, I think, that Japan has not put the plug on its stakes in Russia's Sahalin 1 offshore, uh, offshore oil joint venture as well as the Sahalin 2 LNG project. And this could also be because no similar decision has been made by other G7 countries, even though uh, Japan has also said that it will try to diversify these energy sources, being a resource-poor country. Uh, on top of that, uh, Prime Minister Kishida has also said that Japan would move more strongly towards renewable energy, and uh, the crisis will also have given momentum to restart uh, nuclear plants more widely as well. And Kishida has said that nuclear is uh, should be seen as a stable form of energy, and, and so I think we could see more movement on this front going forward. Right, I see. And regarding the plight of ordinary re Ukrainians, Walter, amid Russia's aggression, I hear Japan's warm welcome to Ukrainian refugees has ignited an unlikely debate over its refugee policy. Could you tell us a bit about that? Right. Uh, I, I think um, the, the, the main point of this debate is because, you know, Japan has thus far historically not been the most welcoming country to refugees or asylum seekers. Uh, Japan has bore the brunt of plenty of bad press of immigrants being ill-treated or even dying whilst in detention. And um, before the Ukraine crisis, Japan's refugee acceptance rate has been historically very low. In 2020, only 47 applications were granted 
granted out of nearly 4,000 people wanting to uh, seek asylum in Japan. Whilst those allowed to stay are left to really fend for themselves or rely on NGOs for support. But this time, in contrast, Japan is really throwing open its doors to Ukrainian refugees. Uh, already more than 400 Ukrainians have sought refuge in Japan. And um, Japan, in doing so, has waived the usual stringent requirements of visas, of guarantors. And on top of that, it's even offering a daily stipend of about US $20 to Ukrainians who seek refuge here. Of course, um, any conflict like the Ukraine war would warrant empathy and compassion and it is good to see Japan you know changing its policies towards refugees and taking in Ukrainians who have had to flee their homes due to war but I, I think this is raising some uncomfortable questions as well over the apparent difference in how Japan is treating the Ukrainians as opposed to other refugees and asylum seekers from other conflict zones around the world. Right I see. Walter some pundits claim the war in Ukraine is spurring a pacifist Japan to consider a stronger defense strategy. What more can you tell us? Yes, indeed. And well, the crisis is somewhat timely because Japan is uh, in the midst of reviewing its national security strategy with a decision to come later this year. Uh, we see hawkish politicians uh, within the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, such as former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, arguing that you know Ukraine would not have been attacked had it not given up its nuclear weapons when it became a sovereign state. So they are using this argument to really push for Japan to be part of a nuclear sharing arrangement with the United United States, its security ally, such that US nuclear weapons can be hosted on Japanese soil. Um, Japan is also, in the meanwhile, considering the adoption of the preemptive strike capability. So what this would do is to allow Japan to strike enemy bases based on intelligence that uh, Japan is about to be attacked. So the argument being made here is that this is necessary as a defensive tool and does not at all shift Japan away from its pacifist war renouncing stance. And I, I think all this comes as Japan really is uh, feeling the heat Japan is really on tenter hooks over regional movements by China, um, by North Korea, and especially Russia. Um especially Russia of late, where Russia has been wrapping up military drills around Japan's waters. It has been hosting live firing drills on the four disputed islands it shares uh, it has with Japan. And yesterday, Russia also conducted tests of submarine launch missiles off the coast of Japan uh, with the target being a Japanese Navy a Navy ship. And so I think all this is really giving Japan a lot of uneasiness about uh, regional security and, and, and is pushing Japan towards taking a stronger security posture. Right. And on the economic front, Walter, I believe Japan is enduring its fair share of hardships amid soaring prices for gas and groceries. Given the crisis in Eastern Europe, of course, and the prolonged pandemic, how are authorities there in Japan responding to these challenges, which of course are universal at the moment, Walter? Yes, indeed. These challenges are universal, but I think it's, uh, you know, acutely being felt in Japan where companies have traditionally been very reluctant to pass on uh, increase in costs to consumers. I think one telling example that recently made the news was this umaibo, the, uh, a corn snack puff stick that had stayed at 10 yen a stick since its launch in 1979. And the fact that, you know, a company, the manufacturer was moving ahead with a price increase of 2 yen to 12 yen really made headlines and uh, went viral on social media. So I think this uh, this anecdote really shows how sensitive the Japanese are to price increases. And, and so uh, because of this, uh, these increases, Prime Minister Kishida has said that his government is going to compile an economic support package this month so as to soften the blow on households as well as companies uh, that are facing due to you know the soaring prices. So this upcoming package is set to focus on four areas, though the details are not yet known. And the four areas are really the higher crude oil prices, uh, ensuring a stable, uh, stable and steady food supply. Um, providing funding support for SMEs as well as providing stronger assistance to those in need. 
But yet at the same time, I think Japan is also very concerned about volatile currency movements. Uh, we see the Japanese yen now having plunged to a 20-year low against the US dollar. And this week, yen is set to take a bite out of company profits as well. So Japan has not yet intervened on currency markets as yet, but all eyes are on a monetary policy meeting that the Bank of Japan is set to convene in two weeks to see if the BOJ will make any policy measures to stem this currency movement. I see. And Walter, before you go, one final very short question on the pandemic front. I understand that uh, the XE variant has been detected there in Japan amid a slight rebound in COVID-19 infections. Tell us about that. Yes, that's right. Uh, the XE variant was actually detected in a traveller who came in from the United States and this traveller was duly quarantined and because of that there has not been any reports of community transmission of the XE variant as yet uh, but still the authorities have said that uh, people should not be letting their guard down as Japan might be on the verge of a seventh wave of cases. Uh, I think they are particularly concerned over the sluggish uh, booster vaccination rate amongst youth. Um, just 46.8% of the Japanese uh, population has had their third shot, which I think is quite low as compared to many other countries around the world. Um, but that said, I think uh, Japan is really reluctant to go back to the days of quasi-emergency or, or emergency restrictions amid this recognition that whilst COVID-19 is still uh, a threat, the Omicron variant is milder and also with the recognition that much of the world is opening up. Um, this slight uptick in cases uh, comes as Japan lifted its quasi-emergency in late March and, and now Japan as a whole is recording about 50,000 cases a day uh, with fewer than 10,000 in Tokyo. So I, I think the sense is that unless COVID-19 uh, evolves into a much more serious variant, Japan will is, is coming to terms with the virus and learning how to live with it. Right, which is also the case here in South Korea. All right, Walter, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you for having me. On the local political front, President-elect Yoon suk yeol has shared his full roster of cabinet nominations, having announced his picks for the Ministers of Agriculture and Labour on Thursday. Our Yoon Jung-min has more. President-elect Yoon suk yeol has nominated former presidential official for agriculture Chung hwang gun as Agriculture Minister. Speaking on Thursday, Yoon said the nominee has 30 years of expertise in the field and has established an overall agriculture policy. Now all of the nominees for Yoon's incoming cabinet have been unveiled. The president elect also tapped former Secretary General of the Korea Labor and Employment Service Lee Jong Shik as Labor Minister, saying he has a sound approach when it comes to issues of labor management relations. 노동 현장의 풍부한 경험과 전문성을 바탕으로 노동의 가치가 제대로 존중받고 합리적 노사 관계 정립의 밑그림을 그려낼 적임자라고 판단했습니다. In the meantime, Yoon's nominee for Justice Minister Han Dong-hun is gearing up for his upcoming confirmation hearing. The Justice Ministry said Thursday that a team to help with the preparations has been organized at a prosecutor's office in Seoul. His confirmation is expected to face strong opposition from the ruling Democratic Party over issues related to politics and the reforms to the powers of the prosecution. Preparations for confirmation hearings are also in full swing for other nominees, many of them having finished organizing the teams that will help them get ready for the questioning they will face in the National Assembly. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. Meanwhile, on the local economic front, prospects are looking quite bleak, that is, amid the host of geopolitical uncertainties facing the international community, which is already plagued by the prolonged presence of Omicron. Uh, Ireyan explains. 
The Ministry of Economy and Finance expressed deep concerns over the outlook of South Korea's economy. In its monthly Green Book report released on Friday, the ministry said that the spread of the Omicron variant and supply chain issues could further slow down domestic demand. The ministry has been expressing concerns on COVID-19's negative impact on domestic demand for five months now. Consumer price hikes were also one of the ministry's main concerns. Consumer prices in March increased 4.1 percent compared to the same period last year, seeing their largest increase in more than 10 years. Production for mining and manufacturing industries increased 0.6 percent in February from last month, but with the service sector falling 0.3 percent, production for all industry has dropped 0.2 percent. However, there were optimistic signs as well in terms of exports and employment. The number of people who were in jobs in March increased by 831,000 compared to the same period last year. With the unemployment rate dropping 1.3 percentage points from last year to 3 percent, the employment rate also soared 2.1 percentage points on year to 67.8 percent. Exports in March saw strong growth, rising 18.2 percent on year on the back of semiconductors and petrochemicals. The Composite Consumer Sentiment Index, which indicates the level of optimism that consumers have about the performance of the economy, also improved 0.1 percentage points in March to 103.2 from last month. Despite these optimistic figures, the ministry said there are still concerns due to the economic impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the interest rate rise in the U.S. and the lockdown of Shanghai, and that the government will devote all efforts to minimizing the harm to the South Korean economy by managing consumer prices and supporting affected sectors. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. And as one indication of the tough times now and ahead, exports of Korean cars fell last month, burdened by rampant disruptions in supply amid Russia's war in Ukraine and pandemic-related lockdowns in neighboring China. Our Min Sukyan reports. South Korea's auto exports fell 7.7 percent in March from a year earlier amid a global supply crunch. Data from the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy shows that around 179,600 cars were exported last month. This was largely due to a shortage of auto chips amid the ongoing Ukraine crisis and China's COVID-19 lockdown, which caused production last month to drop 9.5 percent on year to about 300,000 units. China's strict lockdown measures in places like Shanghai and Jinlin province have forced automakers to shut down factories, disrupting production and delaying shipments. Suspended shipments to Russia also affected the decline in exports. In terms of value, vehicle exports dipped to almost 4 billion US dollars, down nearly 10 percent from a year earlier. It's the first time in five months that exports have declined in both volume and value. However, demand for South Korean eco-friendly cars, such as electric vehicles and hybrid cars, remains strong. Overseas shipments of eco-friendly vehicles surged more than 45 percent to top 41,000 units, the highest figure for any March on record. The export value of such cars also jumped 43 percent to reach a monthly high of about $1.2 billion, exceeding the $1 billion mark for seven straight months. Demand for eco-friendly cars was also high within the country, but overall domestic demand for automobiles fell to about 19 percent on year to less than 139,000 units. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. The capital city is poised to host the 2022 Seoul Marathon this coming weekend. Organized by Seoul City officials, the Korea Athletics Foundation and the Tonga Daily News, the marathon also includes a virtual race. 131 professional runners from nine countries have signed up for the main event, which takes place on Sunday and starts at Kwangamun. Meanwhile, the virtual race will be held on both Saturday and Sunday. Amateur runners will be taking part using a GPS app. Some 21,000 people have reportedly registered for the virtual run. A growing number of Korean adoptees choose to return to their country of birth as adults for both professional and personal purposes. And to facil facilitate, that is, their assimilation into the Korean society, one local entity is seeking to ease their language barrier. Our issue tells us how. Erin Underwood was born in South Korea but adopted by a family in the United States when she was less than a year old. 
A few years ago, she returned to Korea with the dream of ultimately working in the field of international cooperation. But with limited Korean language skills, she felt the need to study. It was then that she heard about the King Sejong Institute, an organization founded in 2012 that aims to spread the Korean language and culture across the globe. Named after the founder of the Korean alphabet Hangul, the King Sejong Institute offers programs for those interested in Korean language and culture. The institute has 234 language centers across 82 countries around the world. It has now collaborated with Korea's National Center for the Rights of the Child to open the first ever class in Korea to teach the Korean language to adoptees in the country. The classes offer training in conversational Korean as well as Korean used in business settings. Park Soo-jung from the United States says that her Korean has improved thanks to the class. Yeah, I feel more comfortable and a little more confident speaking Korean, so I try to use it a lot more, especially with my friends. There are about 20 students currently enrolled, but the institute is looking to enroll more students as around 1,000 overseas adoptees are currently living in Korea. Linguistic competency is what the students need the most in order to work and live in Korea. Our plan is to equip students with the most basic competency. The 16-week semester runs from March to July. Applications for the next semester will open in June. More information will be posted on the official website of the King Sejong Institute and the National Center for the Rights of the Child. Lee Si-hoo, Arirang News. Novelist Po Da Chong has been shortlisted for the 2022 International Booker Prize, which is one of the three largest global literary accolades. Now, this is the third time a South Korean author has advanced to the final round of this prize for fiction in English translation. Here's Kim Bo Kyung. The finest fiction book in the world. That prestigious title and a 65,000 US dollar prize is what the winner of the renowned International Booker Prize will get. From 13 books that made it into the long list, six titles have now become the finalists. Among six finalists is Pora Chong's Cursed Bunny, a collection of 10 short horror stories. The Booker Prize said it uses fantasy and surrealism to address the very real horrors and cruelties of patriarchy and capitalism in modern society. Why did Chong choose a rabbit of all animals to make into a horror story? Well, she had to pick one from the 12 zodiac signs in 2015 when writing a special series of stories with other authors, each picking different animals. All the other strong and more familiar animals were already taken by other authors, and she was left with either a sheep or a rabbit. I knew nothing about sheep, so I decided to pick the rabbit. Bunnies are the weakest among the animals without having any weapon-like features on their bodies. They're soft, pretty, and cute, so I wanted to make it more horrifying. Anton Ha, a Swedish-Korean translator, skillfully captured Chung's prose and allowed readers around the globe to get to know her style. He said that Chung's imagination is one of the best, but also that her prose is something to behold in that it fuses horror and humor together. After just reading a sentence, I thought the literacy was remarkable. Its prose was outstanding. When Chung was among the jury at a science fiction literature contest, she once talked about how lots of books only focused on the science part, not the fiction. She herself pays more attention to prose and with originality. I thought it would sell well right away. Ha also said that he is surprised the book has only recently begun to receive the attention it deserves. Regarding her own original prose and imagination, Chung says she was influenced by the free and fantastical features of Slavic literature. Among Slavic literature, I studied many Soviet novels that were from the 1920s and 30s, from a time right after the revolution when all artistic experiments were encouraged and supported. The arts were free, and I loved such artistic attempts, silly imagination, and creativity. 
Both translator and author agree that although South Korea boasts its own literary value in a variety of genres, they have not been recognized accordingly. Apart from winning the prize, they hope Cursed Bunny's global recognition can steer attention toward other South Korean literature genres. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. In this next segment, we share with you the story of Kang Seok Hee, who was the first Korean American to serve as mayor of a major U.S. city from the year 2008 until 2012. Now, Mayor Kang is currently the chair of the Korean Americans for Political Action, which is a non-partisan, non-profit member organization that seeks to promote the engagement of Korean Americans in U.S. politics. Mayor Kang, it's a pleasure to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be on, on your program. Thank you for having me. Right. Now, Mayor Kang, before we delve into your present life and work, perhaps we could start by walking back a few decades to your early life in the U.S. Now, I understand you immigrated there as an adult with your wife in search well, of the American dream. Do tell us more about that. It's been a long journey. Uh, I came to the uh, United States uh, when I was 23. So that was about 45 years ago. I came with hopes and dreams, but barely with no money. So I really had to work hard, get myself established, learn the language. So that was a struggle that I, I had to experience uh, at the beginning. I could not get a job for about three months. So I was, I was really stressful. Uh, and also once, you know, uh, like three months later, I got a call from a company that wanted to talk to me about a job. I was so excited. I rushed it and went to the uh, interview. As we were talking, the gentleman was questioning and shaking their, his heads because this guy just came to the United States and looking for a job as a salesman. Uh, and it was just was, wasn't going uh, very well. So I have to say something to make a, a determination. What I told them is, please give me three months opportunity. I will make sure that I'll prove it to you. So he smiled and he uh, put me on and I got hired. Right, and ultimately, Mayor Kang, you spent 15 years working there <laughs> at Circuit City, I hear, before venturing into the field of politics. Now, what prompted this particular move? Well, there was a very special event that uh, you can't forget. 1992, uh, April 29. Matter of fact, this year celebrate, uh, commemorates 30 year anniversary of Saigu, uh, LA riots. I was watching TV that night and I witnessed something that I would never have imagined to happen in the land of freedom, land of opportunity, America. There was a looting, there was an arson, and people died. I saw more than 2,000 Korean-owned businesses just burned down to the ground. It's helpless to watch their lives gone away. And I felt a strong a justice, you know, didn't really happen uh, in this, you know, time of, uh, uh, time, time of the uh, time. So anyway, I started getting involved with the, uh, the Korean American community because you have to do something about this. So I joined uh, the Korean American Scholars Foundation. I joined, I served as a president of the uh, Democratic Committee and also served as a chairman of Korean American Coalition Orange County Division. And through that work, the Korean community saw me as a future leader. And I started kind of thinking about, maybe I should run for public office. So I decided to run for a city council in Irvine, Orange County, California. I had no money, no name ID. All I had was a confidence and a hard work. I started walking door to door after walking 20,000 homes by myself, guess what? The people of Irvine embraced me as the first non-Caucasian 
Asian American city council member in the history of Irvine. And then I promoted, I, uh, I ran for re-election, won again in 2006, and in 2008 became the first Korean American mayor in a major U.S. city. And I was re-elected uh, with a 64.1% on my re-election in 2010. So I was termed out in 2012, and that was part of my long history and the involvement with the Korean American community. Right, and Mayor Kang, staying with that, so your journey from product seller, if I may, to political leader, staying with that, I hear you're able to apply the skills you learned in sales to dealing with people in politics. Tell us a bit about that. Absolutely, because it's all about customer service. What I learned during 15 years of my work at Circuit City, I learned how to take care of customers. I learned how to be patient. I learned how to earn credit from the customers. The same token when you serve a public, a public office, what you do is you serve the pleasure of each and every citizen of the city. So I feel grateful that I learned, I spent 15 years with my company that certainly helped me uh, grow all my skills of communication, getting out, meeting people, and making sure that I listen and learn and respond to their request. So that was my success story. Right. And at present, Mayor Kang, you are the chair of the Korean Americans for Political Action. What was the background behind the birth of this particular entity you're associated with? The Korean community now, it's more than two million strong in the United States. We have come a long way, and this year commemorates 119 years of Korean American immigrant immigration in the U.S. However, over the last 20, 30 years, we had, we needed a voice by voting for people. That's the only way we can, we can call to action, to asking for their support and also help to help our community as well. So therefore, I, when I look at it, the voting has been a challenge in our community, uh, Korean American, American community. And also, we are very uh, passive in getting the issue out. For example, recently, as you know, there's been a lot of outcry of Asian hate. However, other communities are outspoken. The Korean community is kind of quiet. So we needed to really build that confidence, build that infrastructure to really uh, you know, play in the mainstream to voice our opinion. When we vote, that becomes our voice. So that's the reason why this COPPA, Korean Americans for Political Action, this is the only national organization that speaks truth to the value. And also, we embrace Korean Americans, whether you're Republicans or Democrats, we unite in making sure that we have our voice heard in this community. Right. So simply speaking, then, Kappa seeks to advance involvement in U.S. politics among Korean Americans. That being said, Mayor Kang, how successful have you been in promoting such engagement? Well, the, uh, we founded in 2020, which is during the year um, two years ago. We had five members of uh, Congress, actually the candidate who ran for Congress in 2020, uh, we had um, uh, Michelle Park Steele, Young Kim, Andy Kim, and Marilyn Strickland, and David Kim. Out of five, we made the history of electing four Congress uh, members, members of Congress uh, in 2020, two Republicans and two Democrats. So this is the beginning of our uh, political empowerment. This is our power. If we can bring everybody together, really to, to advocate how we can advance in a political arena, we can make that happen. And this is the genesis of Kappa, and we're gonna support 
every each and every candidate who is wished to run for not only Congress, but also state, um, local, city council, school board, every level of uh, public uh, office, we want to continue to support whether they're Republicans or Democrats and using our resources to help them grow and succeed in the mainstream. That's our goal. I see. Mayor Kang, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut our talk short because of lack of time, but it's been inspiring talking to you. Thank you so much for making the time to join us live at this hour. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. The death toll following South Africa's recent flooding continues to rise. According to newly released figures, the number of victims has risen to 341 following an unprecedented flood in the country's eastern coastal province of KwaZulu-Natal. With roads and bridges washed away by floods and mudslides, rescuers have turned to helicopters in search of survivors. Meanwhile, Premier of the province, Sikhle Sikalala, added that 40,723 residents have been affected, although no indication on the number of missing people was given. The floods come as the region has been battered with torrential downpours over the past week. It marks the heaviest rainfall in 60 years, with climate scientists pointing to global warming as a contributing factor. The South African Weather Service has forecast continued rainfall until Monday. An Israeli high-powered laser defense system has passed a drone interception and multiple area threat test for the first time. The accelerated rollout of the technology is part of the country's plan to reduce the high costs of its current anti-projectile defenses. According to Israeli officials, the technology uses lasers to superheat incoming projectiles or drones and will be added to the country's existing air defenses. The laser will see initial deployment in Israel's southern region, where towns face continued shelling by Hamas and other militant groups in Gaza. A member of the so-called Islamic State Beatles, who beheaded American hostages in Iraq and Syria, has been found guilty of terrorism charges by a U.S. court. El Shafi El Sheikha was part of a four-person group nicknamed the Beatles for their British accents, who took hostages in order to demand the release of ISIS militants in prison or to collect ransom. Some hostages were released following a ransom payment, but others were executed in propaganda videos. A Virginia court on Thursday found the former ISIS member guilty on charges of lethal hostage-taking and conspiracy to commit murder. The charges carry a potential death sentence, but prosecutors have told British officials they will not seek the death penalty. Of the other members of the ISIS cell, one pleaded guilty in the US last September, another was killed in a drone strike in 2015, and the fourth is in a prison in Turkey. For the first time since the start of the pandemic, Pope Francis visited an Italian prison for a Holy Thursday Mass. The Pope washed and kissed the feet of 12 inmates of different ages and nationalities as a gesture to remember the humility of Jesus towards his followers before his death. Speaking to prisoners, the Pope said that priests should be the first to serve and not exploit others. While his predecessors held the service in notable cathedrals, Pope Francis instead continued his own tradition of visiting prisons and old age homes. Since the start of the pandemic, smaller versions of the service had been held at the Vatican due to COVID-19 restrictions. Pope Francis is set to deliver an Easter Vigil Mass on Saturday evening in St. Peter's Basilica. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good Friday afternoon. We had a rather chilly start to the morning, but it's getting warmer and warmer. Highs will reach around 20 degrees Celsius in most areas, so be mindful of wide gaps and bundle up on your evening commute. But what do you expect? It's April. Well, skies look bright, so you might be wondering if it's going to rain, but later today, those who live or work in and around the Seoul metropolitan area might need an umbrella. Scatter showers of 5 millimeters is expected in those areas, so if you don't have one now, you might want to pick one up before your commute home. And please be aware of offshore conditions. Authorities have issued a high wave advisory with waves reaching 5 meters at their peak in the South Sea. 
So if you're planning to go fishing or take a boat out, please be extra careful. But you can enjoy sunny and bright skies for this weekend and into next week with pleasant weather set to continue for a while. Now let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions. And that brings us to the end of this week's editions of The Daily Report. We'll be back next Monday, so do join us then, and thank you for now. I am delighted to share this congratulatory message for Arirang TV on the occasion of its 25th anniversary. As an ambassador of the Dominican Republic here in Seoul, I can tell you from my previous experience that so far this is the only place where we have a dedicated TV channel in which to convey our messages as ambassadors. I am extremely grateful for the opportunity Arirang TV has given me already twice this year and I look forward to uh, participating many times more. These 25 years have been extremely successful, and all my colleagues are extremely happy, and I wish Iran TV many, many more years of success in their work and in their coverage of the diplomatic scene here in Seoul. Thank you very much. All the best. Coffee that wakes you up in the morning. Potatoes that you cook in many different ways. Rice, a staple food in Asian cuisine. Do you know that these well-familiar foods could soon disappear for good? Because of climate change. The levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have soared because of the excessive use of fossil fuels. This has resulted in the rising temperature of the global surface and climate change. But how are climate change and food correlated? Fruits and vegetables that grow well in a cool climate are becoming more difficult to cultivate due to global warming. Studies say the cultivation area of coffee could shrink